myth number three. Myth number three. It's very American. It's about personal responsibility. It's your own damn fault. You got fat, it's your fault. Okay, that's, you know, it's like almost, you know, like synonymous with America. Your own fault. You know, uh, take the risks, suffer the consequences. So I'm like, here's my question to you. Is personal responsibility in the Constitution? Is personal responsibility in the Declaration of Independence? Is personal responsibility in any state house legislative um, charter? Is personal responsibility in the Magna Carta? Is personal responsibility in Hammurabi's code? Is personal responsibility in anything that even resembles uh, a governmental uh, uh, edict? No. Personal responsibility is an ideology. Okay? It's an ideology. Now, in order to exercise personal responsibility, you have to satisfy four criteria. That is, you must have knowledge of what you're doing. If you don't have knowledge, how can you exercise personal responsibility? Well, here are the 56 names for sugar. And actually, it turns out there aren't 56, there are 262. And if you want, you can go on the Hyper Hypoglycemia Support Foundation website, and they have all 262 names of sugar for you. Do you know all these? Do you know look for these? Here's your nutrition facts label. Notice something. See this purple column here? This is the percent daily value. This tells you whether or not you've eaten too little or too much. It's got everything on it. It's got fat, it's got salt, et cetera. Bottom line, there's one thing it doesn't have. It doesn't have a limit for sugars on purpose. Food industry doesn't want you to know because if you knew, you wouldn't eat any, any of their shit. Excuse my French. Okay. And the new FDA label was specifically delayed by the Trump administration, very specifically because of this issue. So if you don't have the knowledge, how can you exercise personal responsibility? Second, you have to have access. Well, unfortunately, 40% of America lives in food deserts. And if they live in food deserts, they can't even get fresh food that is low in sugar and high in fiber. Well, if they can't, don't have access, how can they exercise personal responsibility? It'd be like expecting a prisoner to be able to eat well when they can't actually cook for themselves. You have to be able to afford your choice and society has to be able to afford your choice. And lastly, your choice can't hurt anyone else because if it hurts someone else, that's called anarchy. So here's my question to you. Is ultra processed food, food? Is it food? It's high sugar, low fiber. Is it food? Yes or no? Well, in order to answer that question, you have to know the definition of food. Do you? Well, go to the dictionary. Here is the definition. And I think this is a fine definition. I have no problem with this definition. Substrate that contributes either to the burning or growth of an organism. Burning or growth of an organism. I think that's a fine definition. So let's look. Let's look at sugar first. Burning. Turns out, here's a mitochondrion. Okay, this is the energy burning factory inside each cell that makes the chemical energy called ATP that your cell uses to power itself, right? And the way it works is you, it, you undergo a process called beta oxidation. That's what happens in your mitochondria. Turns out glucose, okay, which is the energy of life, all cells on the planet burn glucose for energy. Glucose activates two, count them, two enzymes that make mitochondria work better. Activates AMP kinase, which is the fuel gauge on the liver cell. And it also activates this guy down here, HADH, hydroxyacyl-CoA dehydrogenase, which is necessary to get those fatty acids burned in the mitochondria. So glucose, for lack of a better word, is good. Glucose improves beta oxidation. But how about that other molecule in sugar? 
fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, the molecule we seek, it turns out the molecule that is addictive. It inhibits three, count them, three enzymes that allow mitochondria to function. It inhibits that AMP kinase. It inhibits this enzyme down here called ACADL, acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain, which is necessary to start that beta oxidation process. And finally, it inhibits this enzyme here called CPT1, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, which is the shuttle mechanism by which fats get into the mitochondria for burning in the first place. In other words, fructose inhibits mitochondrial function. Fructose inhibits burning. Glucose stimulates it, fructose inhibits it. Well, sugar is half fructose. And here's what Ron Kahn, the head of the Joslin Diabetes Center at Harvard said. He said, the most important takeaway of this study is that high fructose in the diet is bad. It's not bad because it's more calories, but because it has effects on liver metabolism to make it worse at burning fat. As a result, adding fructose to the diet makes the liver store more fat, and this is bad for the liver and bad for whole body metabolism. Couldn't agree more. Remember those 88% of Americans who are metabolically ill? Here's why. And we have proof of that too, in the form of a study done by uh, Kevin Hall at the NIH, where he basically randomized um, subjects to either receive an unprocessed diet first or an ultra processed diet first, but that were all matched for calories, sugar, fat, fiber, and macronutrients. And it turned out that the uh, ultra processed food diet caused more food intake than the unprocessed and more weight gain than the unprocessed as well. And the reason is because the mitochondria weren't working. How about growth? So this is work from my colleague at the universe, at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, head of the Department of Nutrition. Her name is Dr. Efrat Mansinigo Ornan. And here's what she did. She fed rats a control diet. And you can see the nice cortical bone here in red. And then she also fed a different set of rats an ultra processed food with a caloric soft drink. Notice, no red. Take a look at the X-ray of the control bone against the ultra-processed food bone. It's completely washed out. Take a look at the thickness of the control bone against the thickness of the ultra-processed food bone. Way thinner. Bottom line, ultra-processed food inhibits bone growth. And instead of contributing to bone gro to, to growth, what it does is it hijacks growth. It hijacks growth by increasing cancer risk because it stimulates insulin. And insulin is a primary driver of cancer development. Insulin stimulates cancer cells. It's one of the reasons why we got to get the insulin down. Every 10% increase in ultra-processed food consumption increases cancer incidence by 12%. And diabetes too, due to ultra-processed food right here. So bottom line, ultra processed food contributes neither to growth nor to burning. Therefore, ultra processed food is not food. Ultra processed food is actually poison. The main driver is sugar, but the lack of fiber also. And it turns out that 56% of the food sold in America today is ultra processed and accounts for 62% of the sugar in American diet and 67% of the sugar in kids' diets. And this is why kids now get the diseases of metabolic syndrome, even though they're kids. They get the diseases of aging. They get the diseases of alcohol because these are the diseases of mitochondria because the sugar in their diet is inhibiting their mitochondria. And it's not just the beverages. It's not just the cakes, candy, and ice cream. Yeah, it's those, but it's also the fruits and the vegetables, the starchy foods, the meat, fish, and eggs, dairy products, fats, and sauces, salty snacks. It's in everything. It's not just the obvious. We showed in an econometric analysis, which is causational, uh, you know, proves causation, that the only thing in the diet that predicts diabetes change 
country to country across a decade was sugar. That's it, sugar. The amount of sugar in the diet predicted the uh, change in diabetes rates. I wrote this now five years ago, processed food, an experiment that failed. And that's the way we need to look at this. We basically you know, went off on a tangent. We partly went off on the tangent because we had the ability and we partly went off the tangent because we were told that saturated fat was the bad guy. We could get the fat out of the diet. Bottom line, all we did was get sicker and fatter. Here is our consumption of sugar over the past 200 years. All right. So our ancestors getting fruits and vegetables with occasional honey out of the ground and in the trees consumed about five pounds of sugar per year, which is fine. We, our livers can metabolize that just fine. Here's the growth of the sugar industry in the 19th century, CNH and Domino and Texas, Louisiana, Hawaii, et cetera. Here, we reach stabilization where price equal demand, so equilibrium. Here's the rationing of World War II right here. And it came back up to the same level. And here's the introduction of ultra processed food starting in around the mid 60s. And then of course we went even higher because of high fructose corn syrup being cheaper and the substitution of sugar for fat because the dietary guidelines told us to eat less fat. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna overlay on this diagram, the percent of gross domestic product in America spent on healthcare for the same period of time. Ready? What do you see? The processed food came into our world in the mid 1960s. That's when healthcare started going off the rails. Food, ultra processed food is actually poison because it poisons mitochondria. Do you know what else poisons mitochondria? Cyanide, cyanide is a poison. If you poison your mitochondria, you are poisoned, period. And ultra processed food poisons mitochondria. Harvard says reducing sugar and packaged foods could prevent disease in millions. Indeed. I think we ought to rename type two diabetes as processed food disease. Now that's a teaching moment. You have processed food disease. Maybe that'll, you know, get people to wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs>